on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. At the end of the day, everything, whether you're in business, in your personal life, in your political life, in any life that you're in, it's all about sales, which is a relationship business with people. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. I'm your host, and today I have John Kearns here on the King stage. My brother, John, how we doing? I'm great, thank you, and it's lovely to be with you. Yeah, you know, I, I love how you think it's lovely and because that's a different type of language that you guys use over there than, <laughs> than we use here. Yeah, we've did, yeah, that that pond between us kind of caught, you know, wasn't Wild who said two countries divided by a common language. That's right. That's right. You know, I appreciate it because I enjoy I enjoy those finer pieces of language and and you guys do it well. So anyway, John, you are incredible for giving us some time here today. Tell us what kind of businesses that you have. Yeah, I'm currently in largely in the area of social enterprise. Now that's going to surprise and confuse a lot of your listeners. Yeah, what is what the social heck is enterprise? That? <laughs> and uh, listen, all over the world, it's it, it's that question. I I I say it as simply as possible by saying, look, instead of being focused on setting up your business and running your business to maximize profit, we do it to maximize impact. So in whatever business we're in, we're saying, how can we have the maximum impact? So therefore the question is, well, why did you set up the business? What impact are you looking for? And in various businesses, that will be. In my situation, it's really about creating employment, creating economic development in areas that are falling behind. And so that's the kind of the big picture. Behind that, then there are a variety of businesses. We have brewing company, we have coffee companies, we run four very large enterprise centers. So we're incubating new businesses. We're providing training to new business people. We're particularly helping other social enterprises get started. It's a very much a growing sector worldwide and no less so than in the US. Um, A lot of my heroes in the social enterprise world are from the US. And I particularly tend to go with the U.S. model because the U.S. model basically says, look, we're business. We're doing a business here. And so let's employ business methodology. So, right. yeah, it's nice to have a nice a, non, a good nonprofit with a good cause. Right. But actually, unless they're using uh, the efficiencies of business methodology, well, they could be missing out on something. So that's the kind of the approach we take. Yeah, I love that. I think that, you know, every entrepreneur, whether they – think that they're in it for impact or influence is it just sometimes takes them a minute to get there. Have you experienced that as well? Yeah, I totally. I mean, the the biggest thing I find is that when, if you don't explain it correctly, people can't understand what it is you do. You know, you're in the social enterprise. What's a social enterprise? (laughs) Um, And they can't understand. I, I came, I came from the commercial world and it took me quite a long time to get my head around this different way. I never even knew it existed. And and this different way of doing business that is about having positive impact. And of course, it's been growing and growing ever since I got involved because now there are so many areas you want to get involved and have impact in climate change. You want to have impact in biodiversity, in unemployment, in tackling poverty, in alleviating other social problems. And more and more, particularly the younger demographic, are being automatically drawn to that. It, right. It's not finding it by accident. Now they're they're learning it in, in in college, and so they're aware. They're more aware of it than my age group would have been. Yeah, I think that you're you're right on that. Also, too, in the in the journey of business, I mean, typically someone starts a business because they need to like put food on the table. <laughs> I mean, it's correct. Pretty, yeah, yeah, pretty basic. However, I understand that some of the younger generation is, you know, coming up with an idea to change the world, right? Change 
social demographics or, or, or uh, social dynamics. And, and so then therefore an idea starts and maybe some funds are raised, but I, also, I, I think, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Also, I think in my own experience, I'm kind of, I, I, I did a, a, a master's in entrepreneurship and studying entrepreneurship, both my own experience and the, the academic research I found not that many entrepreneurs really start a business for profit. They started for a whole lot of other reasons. Profit, okay, fine, good, but that's never their driving motive uh, sure. to make loads of money. Investors do, right? But not entrepreneurs, and there's a difference. Yeah, yeah, no, and I agree with that for sure. Do you find that for that person who started the business, and again, it, maybe it wasn't because they needed profit or or to become rich or something like that as their main motivating yeah. factor. It's more freedom or you know, maybe the things that are offered inside of that for themselves, but then eventually it has to grow to something more, which is kind of what we're talking about. Is that what you found on your side? Well, sort of. I, I would go I would go one little step further because I think okay. people don't always fully understand an entrepreneur as against a business person. So okay. you can have great business people, and how are they different from entrepreneurs? Are they the same thing? I don't think they're the same thing. Now, there are, there's obviously there's been an ongoing discussion on this. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. But for me, an entrepreneur is somebody who is dissatisfied with something they're an odd group of people they see something they don't like or they see something that could be improved or they see something that just is wrong and they want to sort it out because they have an idea of how to do it better sure. uh, and that restlessness usually means they make very bad employees because they do not accept the status quo right. and right. and then the drive the internal drive is to get out and make your mark get things done the way you see they should be done. Sure. Uh, and I think I think that's, so whether that is that you have a better way to apply acrylic nails or whether that's a better way to teach young kids or right. a better way to bake bread, that tends to be, I think, the, the, the driving force. So what's the business owner? If that's the entrepreneur, what's the business owner? Well, I think the business owner is a different thing. I mean, generally what we say is that entrepreneurs are great at starting businesses. They're not always great at running businesses. Yeah. And the business owner is the person who's really great at running business. So at any stage, at some stage, probably around about the two, three, four year mark, the, the entrepreneur should consider passing on to a business owner and then go and start something else. You know, get, get, so you t you find these serial entrepreneurs. And if I look back at my own, I mean, I've been involved in the music business, the brewing business, coffee business, enterprise center, performing arts, consultancy, networking, all of them with businesses. I, I'm constantly on the move to, to do something new to, yeah. And yeah. It, there is the self-actualization in it also. There's the yeah. achievement goal quite often as well. <laughs> and this is kind of getting into the psychology of it. There's yeah. that needing to prove yourself, needing to be accepted. Right. So right. it's not all positives about entrepreneurs. Yeah. They have to understand and learn what really drives them. Okay. Well, I want to, I want to bring up a topic here that I think it would be super relevant. I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on this. There's, there's this idea of serial entrepreneurship, right? Right. Where you're just doing lots of different things, which it sounds like you have done. There's a misconception inside of that, that you, you do them all at the same time. And so I'm curious to know, have you done all of those things all at the same time? Or was it kind of one after the other? And basically what I'm trying to dwindle it down to is what is your belief around focus? And there's the, you know, kind of the cliche perspective of you can, if you do a lot of things, you can only do them partially well. If you do one thing, you can do it extremely well. And so it's kind of a hot topic in business. What are your thoughts on that? Mm, that's a great, that's a great question. I, to start with, I, I, I get the point about the focus. For me, when I do anything, I only do it when I have a very clear picture in my head. So basically, it's been stewing away there on the back burner sure. for some time. Yeah. It's like a picture that is developing in the dark room. It starts to become clearer and clearer. Yep. And by the end, it is so clear that practically all the work is done. You know, it now just needs you to go and do something about it. But okay. you know what you've got to do. It's yeah. it's like painting by numbers. You just, the, the outline is there. You just need to now go and do it. Right. Uh, so, so quite often you can be doing something else while something else is on the back burner. You're developing, you're hatching that other kind of idea. It's not quite ready yet. Yeah, and you don't even do it as consciously as that. 
It, it, yeah. That's just the, the process that happens within the mind of the entrepreneur. And when you're ready, it will, it will come, it will hatch. But sometimes, yes, I do. I, I also think that a lot of entrepreneurs are busy people. And there's an old expression, if you want a job done, ask a busy person. So entrepreneurs are great at, at multitasking, which is probably why they're not good business people always. Sure. Uh, you know, you, you're, you're, the, the level of focus required to be a great business person right. uh, is probably more than an entrepreneur is. But an entrepreneur is, is a great for doing their piece. And most good entrepreneurs do get, do, do, complement their inadequacies by having a partner who fulfills yeah. all of their, their inadequacies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that you've, you've given us a good description there. Now you did throw out a term earlier that I haven't asked you about it yet. So I'm going to throw it in here into this little mix of conversation. You said investors are a different story and they're out to make money. What, what's the scenario there and how does that compare to entrepreneurship or business ownership? Well, entrepreneurs, the, the classic mis conception of an entrepreneur is somebody who risks, who's a risk taker. Actually, the, the, the academic backdrop to that is that they're not, they're actually very careful risk takers and usually with other people's money. <laughs> okay? they, they, they'll get a bit of friends and family money together and a little bit of their own, but the really great entrepreneurs have the talent for resource gathering. They know how to gather all the, the twigs and pieces that they need to make the nest in which they'll start hatching. And for that, you do need the, 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 the investors. The yeah. investors then, from, from their point of view, they have all the resources necessary and they're desperately looking for something interesting and exciting and profitable in, in which to put that. Yeah. So there's a great, there's a great hand in hand role there, uh, but they're very different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's funny. I've used the term investor in a couple of different ways. Obviously, I'm a real estate investor and and I even considered myself at some point an investor when it came to businesses because I had several of them and the way that I was running them was not as a business owner, not as an entrepreneur any longer, but I felt like my involvement was so little, but yet so impactful, which for me, fit more into the investor category, even though I was still the business owner, I was the one that started them. It, it felt as if I was running that, that portion of my portfolio as a portfolio, not necessarily as, as yeah, a business. And, and I think that's a good practice. I think that's a very good practice. That's like what I was saying about entrepreneurs, start and move on, you know, get it, get it steady, but then hand over to business people who want to stay on the board, be an advisor, be a mentor, or, you know, use your, use your specific talents in, right. in, in a way that, that, that is most effective. Yeah, exactly. Well, we, we got totally sidebarred with some awesome <laughs> quality content there. Hopefully the listeners paying close attention. I think that you gave some great insight. I want to know, kind of going back to my, one of my first questions I'd like to ask all guests here is, is your why you talked about, you know, what you're doing and you talked about the impact for the business owners that you work with, but well, what's the impact for you? Why are you doing this still after all these years of success? Oh, not now. Uh, and at the age I'm at, I should really be thinking of retirement or something on the horizon. So they very, say, right? On the very close horizon. <laughs> <clears throat> and I've had to <clears throat> grapple with that and think, what's my view on that? Because it hasn't really crossed my mind and it isn't in my, in my plans. I don't, I think I can't help it. <laughs> I right. think it's a, it's a disease I have and I can't help it. It's a compulsion. Uh, I mean, you can look at it in a positive way or a negative way, but I mean, I'm going to keep sticking my nose into a lot of things that I see that I kind of think need my particular skill set or vision or capacity to influence. Uh, so I, th I think I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to have to invent one. You know, these old soldiers never die. They simply fade away. And I'm going to have to invent one of those for all entrepreneurs. Old entrepreneurs never die. They, I'm, I don't know. I'll have to finish that somehow. Maybe you yeah. have a competition. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that, that energy really, you know, because I think that most entrepreneurs, at least, I don't know about the business owners, I, I guess investors, I guess probably, you know, from using the language that you've used, maybe you just turn a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more into an investor over, over time. But, yeah. you know, in, in the language that we use inside of gathering the Kings, you have this like warrior stage, and then you have this King stage, and then eventually you have Sage. And, and so you have this, this, this wisdom, this place of, like you said, maybe, maybe it's not the day to day, maybe it's not the running, maybe it's not even, 
you know, the, the entrepreneur start, you know, the energy piece, maybe it's the, the sage wisdom that's, that's before. Yeah. You. And that's real. I, I used to wonder about that. Like, you know, do, do people really get wiser as they get older? But you you end up having seen so much. It's almost yeah. like you're on a merry-go-round. You're seeing this for the second and the third time. You can write the script basically as to what's yep. coming around next time. Exactly. And that, and also you remember the story. You know, you're, you're kind of you're able to give the backstory and the history to how we got to where we are. Most right. people, I I tend to forget that most people I'm dealing with now have forgotten how we got to where we are. And that's kind of important because there's such a trajectory there and there's a motivation that has got us to where we are. And we're probably going to keep going in a similar trajectory. So if you know the past trajectory, it's a good indicator to the future trajectory. That's right. The, uh, The benefit there, as you said, is that you remember or that you, you have some insight that someone either doesn't have because they weren't there before. Or, yeah, yeah. or they weren't paying close enough attention. And so you're right. Experience is everything. And I think that it's even, I find myself even at 35, you know, being able to go, okay, I can, I can chat with a business owner, whether it's inside of our mastermind group or just someone on a podcast or someone just in a conversation, I haven't been in their industry, but we're going back and forth on certain things. And because of my experience with this guy, or because my client over mm-hmm. there in that country or this, that, or the other we now have the ability to have a a pretty quality conversation because I have the experience where I can chat. And that, and that's what, that's what the sage is eventually is that you just have all of this experience, like you said, which then turns into what what apparently is. I I love that. I I love the idea of that, that the elders, you know, the elders, like the, these senior politicians who have taken on the role of being the elder statesmen. I think that's a fantastic role. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're right. There's honor in it, you yeah. know? And so it's not, it's not a, like a, you know, roll the old guy over to the side. It's yeah. there's, when you, when you think of kingship, right? Like you, you think of, you think of the old King who's handing down the crown and you're like, wow, like, you know, all of the, all these years, these decades of ruling well, and, and of course a new, a new brigade comes away or comes out of it, but that doesn't mean that the things of old go away. They, they live on as long yeah, as we want yeah, them yeah. to. Right. There's another point, though, I would add, which is kind of important, and people like me and others need to bear this in mind. You also need to know when to move on, that you might be actually blocking the pathway for somebody who might be better at it than you or more relevant than you. So learning to get out of the way gracefully and encouraging the next ones up is, is a key role, too. Yeah, let's talk about this because I haven't had this come up very often in conversation. And I actually, I I think it's a super unique topic that most people don't think about, especially at my age. But what I, what I often have seen in history is, you know, even taking Rockefeller, right? Like dude was into his late, late years and holding on to stuff. And then eventually he started handing stuff away. Now, of course he tried to do it, you know, through a family foundation and he, there was a lot of activity going on for his family early which was incredible. And, but then some others, it's like, you know, nothing happens until the sage passes. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's this stuff that's dumped, whether it's businesses or wealth or real estate or whatever. Right. And so what we're really talking about is legacy. And so I guess the picture that I have of legacy is like, how do I, how do I, I've got a, you know, young, young kids, they're all under the age of 10. How am I working with them now? So that way, when they're in their teens, we can do some deals together. That way, when they're in their twenties, we can run some businesses together. That way, when they're in their thirties and they have families, we can, we can, you know, like continue the conglomeration and I can continue to pass things. Of course, knowledge at the beginning, but then eventually assets and, and all of the things, all the keys to the kingdom, if you will, way before I'm gone. Would you agree with that philosophy or give us an insight there? Yes, I agree. And it, 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 yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's complex because there are some people and you, you want them to stay around and maybe they should, you know, get out of the way, but stay on the board, be available to, to offer that, that, that link, that kind sure. of history that only they possess and that give, give, give the younger, or even more middle-aged ones, the time to catch up. That's um, right. But I, I, I suppose what I'm talking about is a little bit broader than that. And that, by the way, it, it needn't be an age-related thing. I think one of the biggest impediments to innovation, and if we take innovation within the whole sphere of entrepreneurship, one of the biggest impediments to innovation is the wrong people in wrong positions 
and they're holding those positions. Right. Uh, I, I, I see it as being actually very serious problem. I see a lot of people who manage to get to a particular position and they're staying there. And meanwhile, things have moved on and they're not the right person and there are great people behind them. And if, if, if those people just get out of the way, the other, the others coming behind them could bring a whole new perspective and a whole range of innovations and really invigorate that, that particular sector or that business scene or something. So yeah. it's how do we, I think we, and nobody's addressed this and I haven't heard this addressed. How do we ensure that in, in leadership, in management, it, entrepreneurs tend to do it a, a, a bit anybody in, in leadership and business, how do we ensure that the right people stay at the top? Sometimes it's about getting to the top, but how do you, how do you get them off the top? Right. Yeah. What would you say to maybe the smaller mid-sized business, you know, that's listening right now, they've got, you know, five employees or 50 employees and they've got that guy that we're talking about or gal who, again, maybe not necessarily referencing their age, but they got to where they are because of maybe some previous experience or mm -hmm. success they're, 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 they're the actual, the, the linchpin of what's holding things back. And as soon as you pull it, boom, like things are going to catapult forward, but ah, it's tough because this person has been around for a while and they've got buy-in for the rest of the team, or maybe, you know, like it's sticky. What would you say to that person? Yeah. I, I this is going to sound cruel, but I think it's a nettle that has to be grasped. Now I think you can do it in various ways, create something else for that person and, and right. but you cannot hold back the organization, the other employees, the, the stakeholders involved at all levels. You can't hold them back just because you're afraid to tackle the issue in your business. And if that's the issue in your business, it needs to be tackled. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's incredible mindset. I hope, I hope that the listener pauses that just hits the 30 second backdrop just <laughs> doop, doop, and listens to that again, because um, whatever the issue is you got to tackle it. And it's not yeah. just a, a person that's in the wrong seat or been around a while holding things back. It could be a lot of different situations, which, which is funny because, you know, I've seen that in, in our mastermind peer to peer format, you got seven, eight, even nine figure business owners coming together. And we're talking about what's working, what's not. And you have a person who, you know, seemingly has the same issue over and over and over while you have another person who brings an issue, gets two or three perspectives. And within a week or two, it's like issue solved, addressed, moved on. The next time yeah. we get together, they're bringing something different, right? Yeah, it, you, it's it's ripping off that plaster. You, you need to do it, do it quickly, do it effectively, and then you can move on. But trying to take it off really, really slowly or address it over long, long periods of time is cruel to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. When you have that perspective that it's cruel, it's like, well, wait a second. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to be cruel in, re in the reverse language here. Yeah. So. Um, all right. Well, let's go through some practicals, John, here. I mean, you've got uh, not only experience in your own businesses, but now you're you know, helping and e even incubating other businesses. What's a good decision that you've made, maybe even early on, where you can look back and you go, okay, this one thing has led to just a lot of the things that have gone well for me? Yeah. The, for me, it is about involving a business partner. Like I'm, I'm, I'm an ideas guy. I'm a vision guy which can mean sometimes my head's in the clouds, which can mean sometimes I'm full of, you know what, because I have to experiment. I have to be broader. I have to be weirder. I have to be kind of that blue sky thinker. Having that kind of balancing uh, effect is really right. good for me. Also, it, it forces me to do things. S sometimes you could just engage in lovely daydream fantasies about things you could do and great ideas and things like this. The most important step is that first step that you take and the business partner might be the one who gives you the kick up the backside to make you make that first step and will hold right. you to the kind of discipline that people like me might not necessarily be great at. Yeah. 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 And, and not only are you speaking to an absolute truth, but I just want to highlight whether it's Gathering the Kings or another opportunity, Atomic Habits even talks about this. James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, he talks about joining a community with a, that has a habit that you desire. So you join a community that's like you, that and they have a discipline or a habit that you want to also have, and and then you stay around this tribe so that it it builds this thing in you. Now, what you're talking about is building kind of like your own little tribe with a partner, which I think is fantastic. I've done that. 
and and that's super powerful. But for the guys listening yeah, right now that both, don't have the that, they've got to get around a group. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think both. Because it's funny, I've been thinking about this recently that in 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 my sector in social enterprise, we have a very broad church. And I'm not too sure that's doing any of us any good. I think we need to kind of specialize a bit more, get into our more specialized tribes so that we can inspire and challenge each other really effectively because we know each other's language. We know each other's foibles. We know what we need to do rather than spreading it across an ineffective bunch. Yeah, you know, it's so funny, too, that what you said, I, we know what we need to do, we know this, we know that, and it's so funny because I've got experiences, not only with myself, but with other entrepreneurs, you get into a circle and you're chatting about stuff, and and what he needs to hear, I give it to him, it's fine, because I know it, it's fine, we can, we can go back and forth here even on this podcast, <laughs> and I can tell you something that I know darn well that I probably need to go do better myself, and sometimes that's the swift kick in the hiney that you're talking about is... I needed to actually give it to somebody else. And then I walk away from that conversation yeah. going, dang, yeah. I should probably get better at that too. <laughs> yeah, I do that all the time too. Yeah. <laughs> you, it's you real. It's on yourself. Say it. That's and right. it sounds so real. And you thought, well, oh, take your own medicine. That's right. That's right. Taking the old medicine is a, is a, is a cheat code. It doesn't happen often because it's hard. But if you pay close attention, because it's easy to give it, it's super easy to give it, but. If you if you're paying attention to your own words, even that it's a cheat code for sure. Okay, yeah. what about a bad choice? What have you done that's just like, oh no, stay far, far away from this? I learned a lesson maybe about 25, 30 years ago. A particular business I was involved in and, and a very, very successful project that we were involved in here. And the world and his mother wanted a slice of it. And we, of course, the, the US was the big market. And so we were engaging in negotiations with a whole load of people who wanted a slice of this. They wanted to be, they wanted to have the rights to this for the US. And this, is, this was, I had, I had a, a US friend at the time and he told me this is going to make you gazillions. So we were, we were almost so nervous about getting that negotiation wrong. We were lacking in confidence. The, imp- the impression we had in our mind is, you know, these American big business people are going to chew us up and spit us out and we're going to be left, you know, in, right. in pieces and they'll, they'll, they'll get all the spoils of all of this. So we, we became very tough negotiators and so much so, so much so that I remember one particular guy saying, can't do business with you Irish, you know, you're too tough, you're too this, that, and the other. Yeah. Anyway, we eventually did a deal and in looking at it six months later, I realized, oh, we did too good a deal. Mm-hmm. And that's my lesson. You can do too good a deal. You've got to leave enough on the table for the other guy that yep. it makes it inspires him, it motivates him. And so if, if his margins are too tight, you've you've done a bad deal. That was a really stupid thing of me to do. And I learned it the hard way. We did okay, but not as much as we could have. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I haven't had anybody articulate it quite like that. But wow, I hope the listener it just slows down for a half second here and really pays attention. This is not just, oh, yeah, yeah, negotiations, make a good deal, make a win-win. No, no, no. Like in make if you if you can become a good negotiator, the problem is is that you can make too good of a deal. I've never had anybody say it quite like that. But if you if you squeeze too hard, there's nothing left for the other person. They initially sign up maybe because of your affluence or maybe something that they feel like they're going to get by being associated with you. And they think, well, I'll, you know, I won't worry about the bad deal I'm taking because I'll get this over here. But when they don't get this over here yeah, <laughs> or when it turns out to be hard or harder or margins are yeah. too low, you're, they're just going to leave. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what happened to me. And yeah, I learned that huge. lesson the hard way. So the reverse of that is whether you're looking at a partner or you're looking at a strategic alliance you're looking at some sort of negotiation. You're not necessarily trying to get every single last thing that you can. What you're trying to do is come to the table so for, for a sustainable relationship, longevity, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, for instance, kind of a million times the $1 margin is much, much better than uh, a $2 margin that only gets 10000 Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you got to have the bigger picture in mind. And that's, that's the hard part, right? Because that's, it's a yeah. mature, it's a poise, like yeah. posture. 
and you got to be able to see the bigger picture 10 and 20 years down the road. I was just talking about this similar thing with a guy on the podcast, I don't know, maybe a week or two ago, but this warrior to king mindset, we, we dissect this in several different ways on the show so many different times, but you know, the warrior is like out for the moment, got to survive. Like I'm in the battle. Like I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pinch that deal. Right. Yeah. But the king is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like if this is not a good deal for him, then this doesn't work out for me in the next 10 years. Now I got to go find yeah. another new guy here in six months if I pinch this guy too much. And so I'm going to make it a good deal for both of us, which is yeah. a maturity. It's a king mindset, right? Yeah. Well, hopefully your podcast listeners will can learn that lesson now without having to learn it the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough one to listen to listen. You could, you lose, you lose out on an asset, you lose out on a relationship probably. Yeah. So I actually just had that happen this morning. I had a guy that was following up on, on a deal that we were trying to do. And, and I felt like he was pinching it and I just was like, nah, that's okay. No, thanks. I'm not interested. And, and then he got, he got hurt that I didn't want to do the deal anymore. It's like, yeah. you know, I'm not really interested in doing deals with people who like to pinch, you know? Yep. So got to keep that in mind. It's a, it's a bigger perspective. All right. I want to go to the speed round here, John. We're talking KPIs, right? So you got, again, a lot of your own businesses, but then you're even in kind of intricate parts of all these other businesses. What's the most important thing to track? If you could only pick one, what would it be? I would say the thing you're good at. Now, for, for real entrepreneurs, the things they're, they're good at is actually face-to-face. They're good with people. They're good with sales. They're good with networking. So if there was one metric, I would say is analyze on a daily or weekly basis how much face-to-face -face time you're having. All of us can get distracted and be stuck in the office doing all sorts of different things or reading right. or just in, in fact, the thing that makes you successful is the amount of time you spend with other people, face-to-face -face, relationship yeah. building, all of that type of thing. So measure the face to face time. If you can up that quotient, maybe double it, the success will be double. Yeah. Yeah. It's really impactful. I just want to just hit this home for the listener. At some point, when you realize that everything comes from another person, money, connections, you know, new deals, employees, family, can like every, everything, <laughs> everything you want another yeah. person has. And Absolutely. so everything that John just said to you is to expose yourself to, to more opportunity with people. And that it seems tough because, man, we had lunch today. We did a podcast with John today. What? What money did that bring me? What what did that do for my brand? What did that X, you know, like just super tactical X, Y, Z. It's like, well, yeah, there, there's, well, there's some metrics there we got to track, but what you're talking about is just a bigger picture of flow. Like how, how many opportunities am I giving myself to even be able to flow with other people? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, everything, whether you're in business in your personal life in your political life and any life that you're in, it's all about sales, which is a relationship business with people. So you know, how much time are you giving to that? That's right. And I guarantee you when people analyze it, they're not giving enough time because they're distracted into all sorts of other things that are non-productive. Um, so track how much time. Love it. I love it. What book or even resource would you recommend for a business owner trying to grow their business? Or an entrepreneur trying to grow their business? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show my age now because I thought this might crop up. Crop up. I, the, the book that inspired me most that made a difference to me is a book called In Search of Excellence by Tom Peters. Okay. Tom Peters, still around. Yeah, still around. He, and then he actually came to Dublin and did the Tom Peters seminar in Dublin. And that oh. really, really empowered me. That cut me loose. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a brilliant guy, always way ahead, at least, I think, five to 10 years ahead of the posse. So his, his kind of view on, on business and management and leadership, is, uh, he was talking about crazy times called for crazy organizations. So he was the founder of chaos theory. And he, and he also had this whole concept of brand you. Way before social media and anything, he was saying, brand yourself. Yeah. Make sure you're your own best brand. He was he's, he's quite a radical thinker. So if, if anybody hasn't read Tom Peters, particularly his, his first one, the one that really became a multi-million seller, In Search of Excellence, that's the one that did it for me. Yeah, I love everything that you just said. I haven't heard that. I'll have to grab it. Sounds right up my alley as far as the stuff that gets me hype as well. <clears throat> what do you think about intentionally networking or masterminding with other entrepreneurs, John? Yeah, I, I, I love it, but I think there's a lot of 
false networking. Yeah. Uh, I think I think yeah. it needs to be authentic networking. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean uh, by that? What I mean is I've I've gone to events where there's kind of not networking events, but actually you're not really doing the networking. You need to you need to networking is about finding the person like you were taught finding the person who's in your tribe. It's that right. finding the person who you really enjoy talking to, who inspires you, who you'd love to meet again for a coffee, who you'd love to, you know, there's no real point in my book networking with people who, yeah, we didn't, nothing particularly happened there. Right. Now, that's probably the purists will say I'm wrong on that, that you network with everybody. But I tend to, I, I tend to look for the authentic relationship. Yeah. Somebody that I feel gets me, you know, and I might not be the easiest person in the world to get. Some people are all immediately likable, so they're going to be great networkers. Some people yeah. are not immediately likable. I don't particularly think I am in, in that kind yeah. of situation. So it's it's a question of finding the people with whom you can kind of begin to sense that something between you. Some get it yeah. straight away, others don't. So I, I, think it, it, I think networking is hugely important and hugely powerful, but yeah. just... Don't just do skim it. Think about it a bit more and be more strategic and focused yeah. on it. Yeah, I love the intentionality there. Do you find that that stems from just the value of that you hold on your time, on you as a as an individual? So because you're going to put yourself in situations, you want to do it intentionally with, you know, someone that that's going to be mutually benefiting. No, no, actually, I, and I, I, I mean the the opposite of that. I, I, okay. I don't like, I don't like that kind of almost exploitative nature of networking. Yeah. I really want to find people that I like, people that that I feel I could inspire and that I could be inspired by, the people of, who would be natural parts of my tribe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think we are with the mutually benefiting doesn't have to be that we do business, right? Doesn't have to be no it, it what you're talking about is that we just like to be around i'm inspiring you you're inspiring me so we want to do it again right that's yeah but be... you'll always find you'll always find a way because that, that that other person has a network too you know it mightn't be them you do business with but if you, you become friendly with them and they know somebody else so that, that's kind of a more organic type networking than the the kind of the very uh focused and um, here's my card it's called me <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, I get that 100%. It it uh, I mean, like you said, I, I love how you gave the the distinction. There there's a there's a time and a place for the card. There's a time and a place for yeah. saying, "Hey, I do this. If you need help with it, give me a call." Like that's fine. But generally speaking, what you're referencing is relationship building and yeah, and genuinely putting yourself in situations where there's, you know, maybe a mutual benefit that's greater than just a back and forth exchange of monetary value. Yeah, and, and allow allow great things to happen surprisingly. Some right. of these are surprising contacts that you make. I, I whether you believe in serendipity or whatever, but quite often we we disallow serendipity by staying in a very narrow band. So kind of broaden that yep. band out a little bit. Love it, love it. All right, I've got a question here for you around family. I want to know over the course of your years in business, how have you kept the burning obsession for business? and your family at the same time where, you know, so many gurus that talk about balance, I think they're absolutely full of it. And we just got to be able to go at both with the same fervor. What do you think about that? Yes, I agree. And it's kind of like I said earlier, I can't help it. <laughs> this is me. I'm not, I'm not kind of like, like whipping a horse here to try and make it go faster. This is me. This is what I do. And this is the pace I do it. And my my family life fits into that in the same way. I am just as obsessive about my family life as I am about my business life, and and as obsessive about sort of my 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 children. And of course, they're not children anymore. But uh, yes, I was as strategic and right. as focused on what I needed to do with that responsibility of my life as much as with any other responsibility. And as I say, it's, yeah. it's a compulsion that you can't help. I, I, yeah. to, and to, to, to leave one for, for, at the cost of the other doesn't seem right. Yeah, exactly. Anything practical that you've done, especially when maybe they were younger, you got a, got a guy listening who's got, a, got some young kids and he's trying to figure out how to do both? 
I can tell you a mistake I made. Okay, and fair enough. I, 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 I was, when my kids were doing what, the exam that we call here, the leaving cert, I'm not sure what your equivalent. So this is the exam you do before you go to college, okay, uh, the, sure. the final second yeah. level school. Yeah. And it's a really important because it, it determines what college, et cetera, you get into and things like this. And while they were doing that, I decided that I would lead by example. We would have a house that would be full of studies. And I decided to do an MBA. Oh. And now which... Anybody who's done an MBA knows it's it's not a light undertaking. It's quite it's the the Marine course, you know, in business. Sure. It's, yeah. it's tough going. But I kind of thought, well, this is a good year for me to do it. In that, you know, one was doing a, a, a sort of the, the final exam, and another was doing the mid the preparatory exam for that. And I thought, well, I'll be doing sort of my MBA exams. So it was all good. You know, the EBA example sounds great. The problem was that I didn't realize until afterwards, I, it came across, I was competing with my children. Mm. <laughs> it was a subtle difference. Like when, when their results came out and they had very good results, but probably my results were better. And I, kind of, I felt bad about that, uh, in that, oh, that's, that's a, that's a, that has become a disincentive to them in a way. Right. So right. I think more to be to, to think in terms of of them how you promote them it's not always necessarily a good example they don't want you necessarily to be their their buddy and things like this but knowing that you're there supporting them and all not competing with them and i i, I, I inadvertently competed with them yeah no it's a great story thank you for sharing that that's a very vulnerable but i think that we oftentimes can get it misconstrued that can, that same miscommunication can be, I think, uh, stirred into a lot of pots. And I think that yes. uh, focusing on maybe what, what they've got is, is probably the lesson out of that, which is pretty cool. And, and thinking of it from their perspective, how right. is this going to look to them? You know, I thought the way it would look is, oh, great. Dad's kind of getting down and dirty with us as well. That wasn't, so I might, I read it wrong. <laughs> Yeah. 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 And for the listener who's paying close attention, I mean, you can make the same mistake in business, right? You can assume that yeah. doing something in the business makes your team feel a certain way. And if you don't no. ask or pay attention, it could easily go the opposite direction pretty it's quickly. A perfect so. analogy, actually. Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. I got one last question here for you, John. If you could whisper in the younger John's ear, what would you say? Have confidence. It's all going to work out fine. I think the biggest thing anybody can have is confidence. And I, the younger John didn't have confidence. And maybe going back to what I said earlier, maybe part of that was the entrepreneurial drive, seeking approval, seeking that kind of, um, that, uh, that success, show, striving for the success that I didn't, or for the recognition that I didn't feel I yeah. had or could, or could get. So Yes, it was, maybe it's not a bad thing, but I, if I had known then what I know now, that it does all work out and that I was never going to be poverty stricken on the side of the road and homeless. But when you're younger, that, that is kind of a fear that, oh, if I don't, you know, that could happen, you know, and, and to trust yourself a lot, lot more, you know, I mean, I, I, when I say trust yourself, by the way, most of my kind of uh, decisions come from something somewhere else other than my conscious mind. They come from my subconscious or unconscious or super conscious, sure. whatever it is, but sleeping on something and let, and not trying to force a decision. Right. You know, I've learned to trust that a lot, lot more, and it's generally very good. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it trust and have confidence in yourself. I, I just, I cannot tell you how much I love that answer. I think even at my stage of the game, I, well, first off, I think every entrepreneur, especially as you described a business owner versus entrepreneur, every entrepreneur has this healthy fear, right? Of like, maybe tomorrow it all falls down. I don't know. I should probably yeah, hurry up yeah, quick yeah, and get yeah. another one done, you know, hurry up, do another deal, hurry up quick. And so I think that that's healthy. At the same time, it's it's not, right? Like what you're talking about is that you can it can spin the other way. It can keep you from being confident and moving forward in certain areas. Exactly. And so, I love that perspective. Thank you for giving that. How can the listener find you, John? Whether whether they're they're in your part of the world in Europe and need to have some guidance around how to develop their social impact, or or maybe they're just a business owner and they want to connect with you. How can they do that? 
Well, probably the best way is on LinkedIn. So if you go to LinkedIn and type in John Kearns, K-E-A-R-N-S, my organization is Partas, P-A-R-T-A-S. So if you put in John Kearns and Partas, I think there's a very strong chance they're going to get me. If you can put in social enterprise as well, it might get me, but it's probably going to be up on your website, is it? Yep. Yeah, we'll have it in the show notes here below. So if you're listening right now, you can just open up the app, scroll down and click, make it that easy for you. So definitely get some sage wisdom from John and maybe anything else that his businesses can offer you as a service, we would, we'd recommend that. So John, you've been incredible. Thank you for your time. The fact that you would even be willing to be here and then teach us about how to be here and build relationships intentionally. And just like you did with us here today, thank you for not only teaching us, but also leading by example. And uh, you're, you're sensational. So thank you. Blessings on your family, on your businesses, and all that you touch in 2023. Thanks for being here. <laughs> My pleasure, Jazz. Thanks a million. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing literally over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings literally exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1000 Kings specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.